So let's talk toughness 5 Gretchen, nuclear maneers, and really quite powerful rules that just don't work. We'll look at some of Games Workshop's biggest rules mistakes that they could probably do with fixing in the indexes. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought we'd do a run through of a few of the biggest mistakes Games Workshop might have made in the indexes, focusing on units and combos that are actually kind of important to their armies and are kind of likely to attract some attention with FAQs. Very recently, Games Workshop has issued their first 10th edition proper errata and balance pass, changing their Eldari Strands of Fate mechanic and a bunch of points costs for some things that were doing rather well in the game, plus some fairly blanket nerfs to towering units and artillery. I was kind of expecting that they might pair this with their index error and bug fixes, but it seems that that one's not going to be the case, we're going to have a bit longer to wait for that. They said that the bug fixes for the index cards are going to be coming sometime later in July. This one isn't aimed to be a balance update to Warhammer 40k at all, Generally just taking a look at the index cards and look at the things that just aren't working as intended, either because they made them far too powerful rules as written, or basically don't do anything, as examples of both. So I wouldn't necessarily expect to see anything that reigns in the most powerful units in the game, or buffs the weakest. It'll literally be trying to make the rules functional, and then in theory at future balance passes, like they said in Autumn, they'll probably mess around with some points values, and help out some of the struggling factions in the game, hopefully. As I've been making some index reviews and tier lists, a whole bunch of you down in the comments have been highlighting some of the biggest areas that might need fixing by Games Workshop in these index FAQs. Some of the ones I caught in the video, a bunch of them were ones that I just hadn't clocked until people pointed them out down in the comments. So a big thank you to all of you guys pointing out Games Workshop's weirdness, I thought it would be interesting to collect them together in one video, talk about why the rules matter for their individual armies, and how Games Workshop might think about fixing them. This is only going to be a short list of seven of the more impactful ones, at least in my opinion. There are plenty more that I have noticed that are maybe just more obvious typos and things. Feel free to let me know any other things that I don't cover in this, though. With so many armies and so many powerful datasheet rules, I'm sure there'll be plenty of things that I've not seen yet. Starting off, we've got the Imperial Guard, and something I did notice as I was going through the Codex were the rules for the Death Corps Medipack. Definitely relevant to the faction, as I think that the Death Corps Infantry Squads are now perhaps the single strongest out of the Infantry Squad variants. They just bring really quite a lot of raw power, with bonuses to their hit and wound roll for depleted squads, which can be very very nice if you've got a few special weapons left in the unit. They get more special weapons than most as well, with the option for six different ones within a big 20 block squad, and they can be made remarkably tough as well, a marshal for a 5 plus feel no pain, and if you're willing to embrace the arcane, an allied psyker can also give them a 4 plus invulnerable save, making for a spectacularly durable infantry block. The other thing that they get though that really feeds into this is their death core medipack. pack, you can see it here on the war gear list, at the start of your command phase you get to regenerate D3 destroyed death core models as the medic sticks them back together, but the main problem with this is that it's a war gear ability, meaning it should be represented by having one unit in the squad get some war gear, and technically on the back of the card there's no way to equip a meta pack on any units, even though it clearly comes in the kit as with this guy. I think it's kind of obvious that the squad is meant to have one at least, it should have the option for one per ten models, I feel like maybe the bigger question is whether or not if you've got a big 20 man block, whether or not you're able to regenerate 2d3 death core, as you'd have two medics in the unit. Seems like that's definitely possible, but until there's a bit more clarification as to who can actually pick one up, might be safer to play it with the less powerful version of the rule. Definitely want to watch for the guard players though, the Death Corps Creed can be an enormously durable infantry block on objectives, and they can potentially even just regenerate when they're destroyed up for 2 CP with the reinforcements. Next up was something that a bunch of people pointed out when I did the Leagues of Votan index review, and this one affects probably their best enhancement out of the bunch of them, Appraising Glare. I think that it's probably the best because it just allows you to nominate one objective on the board, and then all the units within range of that objective count as having an extra judgement token on, definitely giving you the plus one to hit against those, with a chance to get a plus one to wound if they've also got a judgement token from somewhere else like a car. The Leagues of Votan are struggling quite a lot at the moment, and they probably don't need one of their best enhancements to be broken, as the rules as this one basically has it functional until the end of the command phase, but not further than that. So basically you have this warlord trait, mark units on objectives, and then the rule goes away by the time you're actually done doing your orders and battle shock on things, so it doesn't actually affect anything in the shooting or the fight phase rules as written, which is clearly unintentional as it wouldn't do anything. Again, it's maybe a bit ambiguous how long this is supposed to last, I guess it probably might mean to the end of the turn, perhaps substitute phase for turn in that wording. That seems like that would be the least powerful version of it, otherwise it might mean until the end of the next command phase, not just this command phase. 
And I guess technically that would be a little bit more powerful as it might mean that you could get judgment tokens against enemy units when say you're firing overwatch for the plus one to wound or if you're in a protracted combat with a unit on that objective. Definitely one that could use a bit of a rules as written fix there I think. Next up we've got a fun and rather unexpected Gretchen one that was pointed out to me on the Orcs tier list video. A rules interaction with how multi-unit toughness values work within the same squad. Basically the general rule across the game is that if you have a squad with different toughness values within the same unit and none of them are just attached leaders or anything like that, then you use the highest toughness value in the unit. In the Gretchen mob you have a whole bunch of Gretchen that are toughness 2 and then Runtherds that are toughness 5 as per standard orcs and they don't count as attached characters or anything anymore, they literally just are part of their unit. To counteract this, the Rontherd rule says that when a unit contains one or more Gretchen models, each time a ranged attack targets the unit, Rontherd models in the squad get a toughness characteristic of 2. That makes sense, means that the Rontherds just by being in the mob don't just give the unit an entire toughness of 5, that would seem a bit silly. But for some reason this only applies to ranged attacks against the unit, it doesn't matter for any other purposes, anything else that keys off toughness values, and perhaps more importantly, close combat attacks, so all of your Gretchen are as big and tough as great big hulking orcs, provided there's at least one runt herd left in the squad. To make saves in combat as well, you don't even need to take the damage on the runt herd, the enemy will roll against the toughness 5, and then you could just take saves on individual Gretchen models, pretty much giving you fantastically more durability in combat than Gretchen have any right to have for around about 4 points per model. It really doesn't seem in any way intentional to me, Gretchen are supposed to be kind of weak and easy to kill, perhaps particularly in melee, so I guess that this is just a bit of a datasheet error for them, and I guess it's going to get FAQ'd. I think even if this does go away though, and Gretchen basically count as toughness too until there's just a couple of runt herds left, but even if this changes, they're still going to be one of the very best datasheets in the Orc Codex still. Mass wounds at 4 points per wound at objective control 2 is excellent for swarming objectives. They farm command points when they stand on objectives, which is just fantastic for a 45 point mob. Plus Zodgrod can make it for a rather annoying unit to try and kill in the midfield by scouting up and adds actually a serious bit of melee threat in his own right. At the moment though with Zodgrod and Gretchen in melee there'd be toughness 5 and also minus 1 to wound. It's kind of hilarious that you could say have a strength 9 or 10 weapon in combat that would wound a rhino on a 4 or a 3 and it would be exactly the same against wounding Gretchen right now. Next up is maybe a bit more of a weird one for the Tyranids, basically just quite a few people looking at spore mines chucked out of biovores and wonder if they really should be quite the gods of tactical objectives that they are at the moment. Certainly for game balance purposes this doesn't really need fixing, Tyranids certainly aren't in a strong place right now, and while they do have a few strong options, I feel like really quite a lot of their index could get some points buffs and it will be absolutely fine. It just seems like a bit of a weird and unintuitive way to play Warhammer that you have spore mines chucked out of a biovore that can just randomly deploy teleport homers or engage on all fronts or get behind enemy alliance when with their objective control zero stats and basically just blowing them up if the opponent looks at them funny. There's just a general sense they probably shouldn't be quite this good on objectives as per the law, basically being living bombs and nothing else. I guess you could say the same of some other things in Warhammer 40k like the Imperial Guard Cyclops Demolition Vehicle but that one doesn't really have the same sort of deployment abilities as the spore mines, just literally being chucked out as part of a biovore's points cost and stuck anywhere on the board pretty much. The way it works is that if you have a biovore lurking in the backfield, then it's got a 48 inch range to lay down a single spore mine anywhere that's greater than 9 inches from the enemies, and as they've got tiny bases they're about as hard to screen out as just about anything in the game. When they land they won't be able to do anything for primary objectives normally as they have objective control zero. But it seems that they can do the 10th edition sort of pseudo actions, things like deploying teleport homers, investigating signals, or doing behind enemy lines or engage on all fronts. They are allowed to forego shooting to do these things, even though they don't have any shooting themselves. That was by the designer's commentary, and I think that does make sense for most units to be fair. Things like, say, melee specialists with no guns still makes sense they could do the action type things. Just seems like a bit of a weird unintentional interaction to me, and probably not the way that Games Workshop envisaged Tyranids having an advantage over the other armies. I feel like if they actually want to make Tyranids strong it's probably best to just buff a whole bunch of units, as opposed to have slightly strange objective advantages for throwing down mines in random places. Next up there's another perhaps rules as written slightly broken enhancement, but this perhaps for the positive for the World Eaters as opposed to a negative. In the World Eaters army their rule is that you roll 8 dice and try and get certain blessings of corn, some of them are guaranteed to get, some of them you might want to roll kind of high like say the advance and charge one which is kind of big, and the angron one is downright hard to get for a lot of armies, needing 3 sixes, which you are kind of unlikely to get unless you're lucky. One way in which you can raise the chance of getting any one roll is the favour of corn enhancement, 
basically allowing you to re-roll the blessings of corn dice after you've done it. And then after that, you can still modify it a bit more with things like Berserker rerolls. To me, it seems pretty clear that the intent is that you probably just use this once per command phase. But the way that Games Workshop's written it means that at least rules as written, if you really wanted to, you could just keep on using this and just keep on rolling away until you get the exact dice that you want. For some reason, there's nothing to say that you can't use it multiple times in a command phase. And just keep on rolling the dice until you find those three sixes to resurrect Angron or something. I don't think anyone would argue that that's the way that it's supposed to work, and it's not something I personally choose to take advantage of, as it seems quite clear what the intent is, but it's most definitely one that I'd expect for Games Workshop to FAQ when they do their index rules, as at the moment one of the more powerful corn enhancements basically allows you to rig the blood dice in your favour. Next up, one that I noticed while talking about through the Necron Index was the Silent King's Nuclear Meneers. Similar to 9th edition, when the Silent King's days gets taken down, it's got a chance for really quite a big explosion. This is kind of mirroring him having an enchained katan in his throne. When those things get out of confinement, they cause a fair bit of destruction, and it means that when he goes up with a bang, it goes up with a very, very big bang. To represent that in 10th edition, they've got Deadly Demise D6 plus 3, one of the bigger Deadly Demise results in a game, and it means that if the Silent King does get taken down and the Necron player rolls a Fatal 6, it could have a big chunk of their army just vaporise in the ensuing explosion. I'd say that due to the Katarn thing and the way that it worked last time round, it looks like this rule is mainly aimed to be targeted at the actual Silent King model itself, but at the moment it looks like it equally works on the Meneers as well, as they're part of a 3 model unit, and there's nothing to say that they don't get that enormous deadly demise result. The Meneers with only the 5 wounds are significantly easier to kill than the Silent King himself, so it means that if you gun down the two Meneers, then you get two chances to get that fairly apocalyptic explosion going off within the same unit. Perhaps if the Necron player is extra unlucky and the reanimation protocols regenerate a Meneer on one wound or something, you might even have more than that. Overall, if the enemy does manage to bring down the Silent King, which admittedly isn't that easy a task with a 2 plus save and a bunch of wounds, you basically have almost a 50 50 chance of the Silent King going nuclear and showering the rest of the Necrons around him in mortal wounds. Kind of problematic when you usually want to cluster up for him for his nice shooting rerolls. If the Meneers explode as well, it also looks like they'd affect his own unit. It's entirely possible that with exceptional bad luck, the opponent could kill the one Meneer, that could explode and kill the other Meneer, which could also explode and damage the Silent King as well as all the Necrons as well. Sounds unlikely, but when you kill one Meneer, that's going to happen somewhere around, say, 1 in 40 to 50 times. There is just a small chance that the first Meneer doesn't kill the second one. My guess is that it's probably meant to be the Silent King that has that enormous explosion, and not the Annihilator Meneers that are supposed to be a bit more of a durability buff to him. We'll be interesting to see if Games Workshop decides to fix that one. Finally, I just thought I'd mention one for the rerolls for the Imperial Knights. This is one that I've mentioned on the channel previously in the Knights Index, and it affects the rerolls that they get from Lay Low the Tyrant, the chivalric code that basically most Imperial Knight armies will want to pick up, getting you some big rerolls and buffs to your damage output all game long, and it's really quite powerful. The Oath ability states that each time this model is selected to shoot or fight, re-roll a hit roll of 1 and re-roll a wound roll of 1, which sounds very very similar to multiple other special rules across Warhammer 40k, but there is a subtle difference saying that it's each time the model is selected to shoot or fight, as opposed to each time this model is selected to attack. If you say each time it's selected to attack, that would translate to re-rolling all hit rolls of 1 and all wound rolls of 1, I would say that the latter more implies that you re-roll a hit roll of 1 and a wound roll of 1, exactly as it says. Rules as written, I think it actually depends on your interpretation of the letter A within that sentence, whether it means one single one, or just a hit roll in general. I think that you could genuinely argue it either way. I've seen plenty of people discussing this be absolutely certain that one interpretation or the other is right, to the extent where it definitely needs an FAQ, particularly when it's a massive damage boost rule for perhaps one of the stronger armies in the game or at least it was before they got loads of points nerfs, I suppose. There are other clues to the right interpretation, though. Cards printed in other languages are a bit more clear to say that it's every single hit roll and wound roll of one that gets re-rolled, not just one of them. That does seem to be how large tournaments are generally ruling it, and in general this would be a bit of a weird rule within 10th edition 40k. Most of the time rules like this don't just allow you to re-roll one single dice roll that's a one, they'll usually say just one single dice roll in general, they don't usually limit it to a specific value. For that reason, I'd guess that it's probably meant to be all hit rolls of one and all wound rolls of one, though I'm not convinced that that's definitely what they've written rules as written. And even if that does turn out to be the case, it's still a bit weird, really. It just seems enormously imbalanced versus the plus one to move, advance, and charge. Basically, getting a plus 36% damage increase to all your knights all the time is pretty much always going to outweigh that. And also, the previous version of the rule was just re roll one single dice, maybe making it seem that the tyrant's rule might have been a bit more likely to follow that on 
though obviously that rule has no bearing on this one rules as written. Seems that more people are playing it as re-roll all hit rolls and wound rolls of one, though I think that's more going by the external clues than the rule itself, maybe. Either way, with lots of people debating it, it seems like it's definitely one that needs an FAQ, particularly with knights having really quite a lot of power right now, even if most of their towering data sheets have gone up a bit. In any case, let me know your thoughts on these, which of these do you think Games Workshop might address, and when they do, what do you think they might do with the units involved? As I said, feel free to mention any other things that maybe seem unintentional or a bit weird within the indexes, I'm sure I've missed plenty of stuff here that will be kind of interesting to talk about. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, but I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that link down in the video description. The channel's Patreon page is what allows me to keep these videos coming quite so regularly, so if you are enjoying a lot, any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.